Hello, everybody. Welcome to the COVID Neuro webinar. I'm Tom Solomon. I'm at the University of Liverpool. And today we're joined by Cecile Delorme from the Salpietre in France and Jerome Breen from King's and also Cameron Watson. You'll be hearing a bit more about that later on. Just some slides by way of introduction for uh, what, what, we're, what we're here and what we're here for. This is, uh, we've been running these webinars now every month. I think it's about the fifth or sixth. And uh, the idea is to really get an update on some of the latest research on COVID and its neurological diseases. Those are some details of the speakers. It's hosted by the Global Health Network, which is a knowledge exchange uh, network, which also supports training and professional development and uh, has, has supported this series of, of, of webinars. We like you as, as, as guests, as, as listeners to uh, get involved. And so um, what you can do is use the chat function uh, to let us know what questions you have. And what we'd like you to do, just to practice it, I'd like everyone to type something into the chat function now, maybe tell us where you're uh, listening from and whether this is the first time you've joined in. And I will then be able to see your chat comments. So do send us a message in now. Uh, it should be working. It's also a chance for us to check it's working. Alternatively, I can see the Q&A function is open. Is the chat open as well or is it just Q&A this time? Both are open. Both are open, right. So, um, and I can see we've got lots of participants. So please do, uh, there we are, there's some chat. Tell us where you're watching from and whether it's the first time or whether you've watched many. I can see Ava Easton's there. She's a regular viewer. Hi, Ava. Somebody from USA, Italy, Sydney, Norwich. We've got all sorts. Excellent. Great. And we'll look forward to your comments as the, uh, as the webinar continues. So I'm based here at the uni I should also say, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, we have a live stream on Facebook. You can post questions onto Facebook and they'll be translated over. They'll be copied over to our chat here. So we do want to hear what your questions and comments are and we'll come to those. Okay, so I'm based here at the University of Liverpool, the Walter Neuro Centre, and also uh, at, here at the university where we have a strong focus on infections. I head the Liverpool Brain Infections Group, uh, which has worked on a range of neuro infections over the years, and in particular now on COVID neuro. You can see some images there. There's Laura Benjamin, who does a lot of the work on stroke. There's Ben Michael, who is heading the uh, UK COVID CNS study. This webinar is hosted through Brain Infections Global, as you can see, and on the uh, Brain Infections Global website, we have various things of relevance. We have training tools. Um, this next slide shows you the number of people who have followed us through the uh, Global Health Network, many visitors and members, and you can join our Brain Infections Global team if you wish to. We have a neurological infectious disease course we run every year and also free online e-learning modules on the website. Uh, this is the home page of Brain Infections Global and on here we have some COVID neuro resources. This is a, a list of articles that are relevant to COVID neurological disease uh, and that's updated regularly. And then in addition, uh, we have um, the uh, tab here for those who want to download free tools to help you study patients with neurological COVID disease wherever you are based. And these are the case record forms that you can download freely. Sorry, I'll go back. And uh, we've had thousands of people around the world uh, collected their COVID neuro problems collected on these case record forms and we're putting those together. You'll hear a bit more about that shortly. Uh, this article in the Lancet Neurology is now published on neurological associations of COVID-19. And as I mentioned, through the network, we've been collecting data on more than 2,000 patients now and, and uh, more than 70 contributors. So if you want to contribute data to this global meta-analysis, then please do. Today's speakers, anyway, uh, are going to pick up on a couple of uh, particular aspects and in particular reporting on some studies. And our first is Cécile Delorme, from the Salpietre Hospital in France. Uh, and so I'll now hand over to you if you want to share your screen. It's very good to have you with us, Cecile. 
Thank you, Professor Solomon, for uh, inviting me. I am very happy uh, to uh, present uh, uh, the results from the COCO Neuroscience uh, study, uh, which is a cohort of patients with COVID-19 and neuropsychiatric manifestations. So uh, what is really uh, exciting uh, about this study, in my opinion, is uh, the multidisciplinary uh, approach as uh, we included um, all departments from the from fields of neurosciences, uh, from neurology to uh, psychiatry, uh, neurorehabilitation to uh, neuro ICU, neuropathology, neurophysiology, etc., in uh, several uh, university hospitals in uh, in Paris, and uh, this uh, allowed to collect very uh, diverse and um, and uh, rich uh, data. Here is a representation of the evolution of the pandemic in, uh, in France. Uh, the results of the cohort I'm going to show you today um, uh, concern uh, 245 patients who were seen between March and August 2020 uh, during the first wave uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this represents approximately 12% uh, of all COVID-19 patients uh, seen during this period um, in, a, in a, our uh, center. Uh, and of these uh, 245 patients, uh, 47 patients were uh, hospitalized in the ICU. The primary objective of our study was to describe de novo uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations occurring in patients with COVID-19. We use the diagnosis criteria of the World Health Organization for uh, uh, clinical cases of, uh, of COVID-19 and for uh, uh, COVID-19 severity uh, staging. And uh, for the case definitions of neurological uh, manifestations, we use the criteria as proposed by Professor Salomon team in, uh, in the Lancet Neurology. The investigators entered uh, patient data on an ECRF uh, hosted on the REDCap software. So here is the main uh, results from our uh, all cohort of uh, 245 patients. Here you see the relative representation of the uh, different neurological uh, syndromes. And uh, you see here that there are four uh, predominant uh, syndromes, which are encephalopathy in 42% of the patients, critical illness neuromyopathy, psychiatric disturbances, and cerebrovascular disorders, which can be considered as uh, non-specific critical illness, ICU-related um, complications. And this contrasted uh, with the rarity of more specific uh, immune uh, post-infectious uh, disorders, uh, such as encephalitis, Guillain-Barré syndrome, and uh, myelitis. Regarding psychiatric manifestations, data was analyzed by uh, Redwan Matud here, and uh, we found uh, a high prevalence of uh, mood disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, including uh, acute stress syndromes. Uh, no patient developed uh, de novo uh, psychosis. Our neuroradiology uh, team uh, published uh, this paper in uh, radiology, which I uh, highly recommend. Uh, they describe the MRI features in uh, 73 patients. Uh, MRI was abnormal in 59% uh, of uh, these patients. Uh, so they, they describe um, a very wide range of uh, MRI patterns, uh, so stroke, uh, obviously. Also micro hemorrhages, as you see here. Uh, which were um, mainly seen in ICU patients, uh, sometimes treated with ECMO. Also, cytotoxic lesions of the corpus callosum. And they also describe some more uh, particular uh, uh, MRI uh, features, such as basal ganglia uh, lesions. Here you see implicating the substantia nigra and uh, pallidum. And they also described uh, in four patients uh, lesions of the white matter, uh, punctiform lesions with uh, gadolinium enhancement. Virginie Lambreg, Vincent Navarro, and their team uh, have written a paper uh, about EEG uh, findings in uh, 78 patients. They found uh, fo focal frontal slow waves in 24 patients, 
encéphalopathie pattern, mainly uh, triphasic waves in 23, et puis leptic activity in 4, and periodic discharges in 6. Here you see an example of periodic discharges predominating in the uh, frontal uh, area. And interestingly, uh, periodic discharges were associated with uh, white matter and basal ganglia lesions because they crossed their uh, data with um, neuroradiological uh, data. And they further identified a subgroup of nine patients uh, with presumed COVID-19 directly related encephalopathy, meaning these nine patients had encephalopathy without uh, any other obvious cause, such as uh, severe apoxia or uh, metabolic disturbances. And interestingly, um, these patients with COVID-19 related encephalopathy more often had uh, periodic discharges, meaning that it could be a more specific um, feature. They also had more often uh, white matter enhancing lesions. And clinically, these patients uh, add um, more often than uh, other patients movement disorders, frontal syndromes, and uh, brainstem injury. And uh, they found that the, um, um, the association of uh, these different features could predict um, in a statistical model uh, the, the fact that patients had COVID-19 related uh, encephalopathy. Our uh, neuro ICU team uh, also published a paper in a brain uh, in which they described five patients, uh, five ICU patients uh, with uh, encephalopathy. Uh, clinically, these patients uh, mainly presented with um, disorders of consciousness after sedation with the role. Uh, none of the patients had evidence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, the, in the CSF. One patient only had um, elevated uh, cells, stem cells in the CSF, and uh, one patient had elevated uh, protein uh, in, the, in the CSF. Uh, the patients often had uh, white matter uh, lesions on brain MRI. And interestingly, uh, they, uh, they treated all patients with uh, immunotherapy associating corticosteroids and uh, plasma exchange. And three of the patients dramatically improved uh, with plasma exchange after a few days, even if they had been unresponsive for months, uh, which uh, strongly argues for uh, an immune mechanism in uh, these cases of COVID-19 related encephalopathy. We also published a paper um, in uh, four patients with um, also presumed COVID-19 related encephalopathy. Uh, these patients had uh, uh, focal neurological signs and um, uh, clinical uh, features of encephalopathy without um, uh, another uh, cause uh, for encephalopathy. And we investigated these patients with uh, FDG uh, PET CT, and we found a common pattern of hypometabolism in the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and hypermetabolism in the cerebellum, uh, which is a pattern consistent with uh, encephalitis. And we went uh, a bit further with uh, Aurélie Cass, who is the uh, chief of department of nuclear medicine in La Pitié Salpêtrière. Uh, she performed a quantitative analysis in seven patients with COVID-19 related encephalopathy compared to a group of controls. And we found uh, in this group of COVID-19 patients, uh, hypometabolism in the prefrontal cortex, as previously shown, but also uh, in the uh, cingulate cortex and in the insula. And this is interesting because we know that uh, these regions are uh, strongly interconnected, they are part of a network uh, which is implicated in the processing of emotions. And we think that maybe uh, disruption uh, in these um, brain regions uh, could explain, um, at least in part, uh, the emotional disturbances uh, which uh, patients with COVID-19 sometimes experience, such as apathy. Uh, and also, uh, we know that the insula is involved in interoceptive awareness, and maybe disturbances uh, uh, in the insula region could explain um, alterations in uh, uh, 
perception of internal signals, such as uh, dyspnea perception, uh, which is often uh, altered in uh, COVID-19 uh, patients. What we also found uh, exciting about these results is that this uh, particular network is known to be uh, very susceptible to inflammation, in particular to uh, cytokine-mediated uh, uh, inflammation, and that this could be um, an indirect clue for uh, uh, cytokinic immune mechanism uh, in uh, this, um, this particular pictures of uh, COVID-19 related encephalopathies. So to sum up, I would like to insist on uh, the importance when you look at the whole cohort, uh, the importance of uh, ICU and critical illness related disorders. Uh, also uh, the high incidence of strokes and psychiatric disturbances, uh, but also uh, in this uh, subgroup uh, of patients uh, who present um, a different uh, picture of uh, encephalopathy uh, in which MRI, EEG and uh, FDG PET CT uh, can be very valuable uh, exams. And uh, it is important uh, to uh, come to diagnosis uh, in these patients as um, they can be uh, much improved with uh, immunotherapy. We have a lot of other uh, works uh, uh, in the pipeline and I will be happy to uh, come back to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, for example, neuropathological data, uh, further characterization of encephalopathies with biological data. Thanks a lot to all the Coco Neuroscience uh, uh, family and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that, Cecile. That's, uh, those are some great data coming through. Really appreciate that. So we, we, people can post questions or comments on the chat function if you'd like to. And uh, I've got one here. The first one is from SR. I don't know who SR is or where they're based, but uh, they say you mentioned affection of the basal ganglia in the radiology. Uh, you also talked about movement disorders. Was that in the same patients? Did you see movement disorders in the patient with the basal ganglia affected? Uh, it, it was not, uh, it was not uh, related. Um, uh, the movement disorders we uh, most commonly observed um, were um, myoclonus, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, with um, very particular patterns, sometimes uh, rhythmical uh, myoclonus, like uh, myorrhythmia, uh, axial myoclonus. Um, there was no uh, specific uh, correlation between um, basal ganglia lesions and, um, uh, and movement disorders. I have um, in mind the example of a patient who had uh, uh, mild Parkinsonism, uh, but the, the relation between Parkinsonism and uh, uh, basal ganglia alterations in this case is not uh, straightforward as uh, the, um, a lot of patients were treated with uh, antipsychotics in uh, ICU and uh, uh, Parkinsonism was uh, improving, so um, it's important to, you know, to also to, to see the patients in the long term to have an idea about that, but uh, the short answer is no, there was no clear correlation between the clinical picture and the basal ganglia lesions. Okay, thank you. Now, someone called Eliana Altamente uh, has raised a hand, which I think means they have a question that they'd like to ask themselves. So, Eliana, Elen... El Elenia, do you want to ask your question directly? We've allowed you to talk, so you can speak if you want to ask it. If not, most people are sending in questions via the... I'll have to ask you to unmute. There you are. If not, people are putting in questions via the um, chat function. Uh, SR, they've told us their name is Sujoy from India. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Fanny... Michelle is asking, uh, thank you for the great talk, very comprehensive approach by your team. Congratulations on that. Uh, have you identified any risk factors for COVID-19 patients to develop neuro-COVID? That's a pretty critical question. Um, yeah, th th that's, a, that's a good question. Um, if I... Um, sorry. Sorry about that. Don't worry. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
Uh, statisticians performed uh, correlation analysis. So here you see a matrix of correlation. Uh, what we can say, um, because it, it was a retrospective study and uh, it is uh, difficult because we, we don't have a, a control group with uh, patients with COVID-19 without neurological syndromes. So we, we, can, we can't um, uh, compare. But uh, what we can say is that um, patients with critical illness neuromyopathy were patients with a long stay in ICU. Uh, it was strongly associated with a stay in the ICU of more than um, uh, 12 days, which is uh, quite uh, uh, logical uh, that um, a long stay increases the risk of developing uh, neuromyopathy. It was also associated with some uh, comorbidities uh, such as obesity. Uh, for encephalopathy, Encephalopathy was also strongly associated uh, with comorbidities and with older age, uh, so with age between um, uh, six, uh, 60 and, uh, and uh, 80. Um, regarding cerebral vascular disorders, we also found uh, um, a, a strong predominance of, of patients with uh, comorbidities. Uh, uh, smoking, pulmonary disorders, and, uh, and cancer, I, as you see uh, here also. Um, so this is, these are the main uh, uh, correlations uh, that we were able to, uh, to identify using our statistical analysis with the limits that we do not have a control group. Great, thank you for that. One thing I was going to ask you about, you mentioned immunotherapy and you've, you've published that nice paper in Brain. Um, now, of course, everybody who is hospitalized and is severe enough to need oxygen is getting corticosteroids. Hmm. What, what do you think the impact of that will be on the development of COVID neuro? To be honest, I, I really don't know. Um, I think that um, Corticosteroid uh, responsive uh, encephalopathies really represent um, a, a minority of uh, central uh, manifestations of uh, COVID-19 um, because when when you look uh, at the details uh, of the, the files of patients with encephalopathy. So this is a work which is ongoing, by the way, with uh, our team of uh, geriatricians. So we look really um, uh, at the details, uh, but uh, the, 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 the view that I have in my mind is that most of the patients with encephalopathy had uh, other causes for encephalopathy. Uh, yeah. So, they were older patients, uh, they had uh, um, severe uh, hypoxemia, uh, some of them had uh, multisystemic uh, disorder, uh, they had uh, um, kidney uh, dysfunction, uh, they had metabolic dysfunctions, uh, iatrogeny iatro also from um, um, ICU drugs, etc. So I think this really represents uh, majority of uh, patients with, uh, with encephalopathy uh, and, um, and that the immune uh, encephalopathies really represent a, 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 small, uh, a small subgroup. Uh, but in this subgroup, it, it can be uh, interesting. Um, the experience of our neuro ICU team, because they treated, uh, they published these five patients, but um, they, they they, they tried uh, corticosteroid immunotherapy uh, in uh, more patients. Um, what I uh, understood uh, about their experience is that um, it, it's really plasma exchange uh, in this uh, particular patients, uh, which uh, led to improvements and very quick improvement. Um, with corticosteroids, it's not that it's not that clear. Uh, sometimes it can improve, but with time, so it's uh, always difficult to uh, disentangle this from uh, natural evolution. Uh, but with plasma exchange, it seems to be something very quick. Uh, and uh, okay, thank you. There are more questions, uh, which is great. So we may come back to these other questions later on in the in the general discussion. Um, but for now, uh, thank you very much, Cecile. That, that was fantastic. So we're gonna next. We're gonna have a short interlude, almost a musical interlude. Cameron Watson 
if you want to share your screen, Cameron, uh, is um, one of the people who have been doing this blog, the JNNP blog, which includes updates on the latest publications on COVID neuro. So I think, Cecile, if you stop sharing, and Sorry. Cameron, if you do share. Uh, Can you see that okay? Uh, yeah, I think we need something. Hold on, there we go. There we are, great. So Cameron is going to, many of you will be familiar with this, this blog, which has the uh, uh, updated publications. And I asked Cameron just to choose five and talk us briefly through five papers that he thinks everybody should read. Thanks for that, uh, Professor Solomon, and um, an amazing talk, Cecile, really amazing data that you're presenting. Um, apologies if it's not as musical as you've built me up to be, but hopefully it's uh, going to give people a nice flavour of what we've been seeing in the blog so far. So as this is our first appearance on the webinar, I'm hoping to summarise five of my sort of favourite papers in just five minutes, so a little bit of time pressure. But hopefully that does the author's justice and gives you all a bit of a summary of what we've been seeing in the literature thus far. So we've really been in a privileged position to watch the literature grow in both quality and of course quantity over the last few months since the start of the pandemic. Um, perhaps the most seminal sort of initial paper to identify the true breadth of possible neurological and psychiatric manifestations in COVID-19 was this first iteration of the ongoing coronal nerve study, which Tom has already spoken about, led by Ben Michael and others. And now in the first three weeks of this UK-wide surveillance study, physicians reported 153 cases of patients right across the age range from 23 to 94. Now the majority of these patients had a cerebrovascular event, which is tied in quite nicely with more recent sort of studies, and actually 31% had an altered mental status. Out of those with altered mental status, 40% were diagnosed with an encephalopathy. And the remainder actually had psychiatric diagnoses ranging from psychosis to cognitive and affective syndromes. Now, importantly, in the majority of these cases, they were new diagnosis. So whilst cerebrovascular events predominated in older patients, conversely, the altered mental status actually had a disproportionate representation in the young patients who reported to the surveillance study. Now, although limited prevalence data can be taken from something that is physician report only, this paper really laid the foundations for what was now, or what is now really uh, a really wide ranging study of a varied um, set of potential COVID-19 CNS manifestations. But there's been a bit of debate on, you know, how these manifestations are actually caused. And the authors of this particular study, which I, I really do like, um, asked whether there was any evidence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies within the CSF of eight encephalopathic patients with COVID-19. Now, this is important because several case series have found no evidence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the CSF of COVID-19 patients, which is ratified by this group as well. So they conducted routine CSF analyses and full autoimmune screens, which all came back as negative. However, interestingly, all patients had high titers of anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgG in both their serum and their CSF. Moreover, CSF in three patients was also positive for the protein 1433, which actually may suggest the onset of some form of neurodegeneration. Now here the authors provide some really nice evidence of some blood-brain barrier breakdown and speculate that antibodies entering or being produced in the CNS itself might actually directly cause neurologic damage by mobilizing a neuroinflammatory response. Now we've mentioned cerebrovascular disease, it's something that came up quite early in the literature and it seems to occur in around 2% of admitted patients with COVID-19 and actually seems to also coincide with a, a high rate of large vessel occlusions. Now, more recently, there've been some really big multi-center studies, but I really like this study in brain as it gives a nice deep dive into the kind of clinical lab imaging and pathological parameters of cerebrovascular disease in COVID-19. So just under 1.5% of their cohort developed an acute cerebrovascular event and amongst the 17 were ischemic strokes, 10 of which had large vessel occlusions. The overall clinical outcome was pretty poor actually. However, regression models only found age as an independent prognostic factor. 
But the real sort of nice part of this paper is the, the dive into the, the potential pathology that's going on. So the biopsy samples that were taken suggested that actually endothelial disruption was the main mechanism driving the damage. And the neuroimaging that they actually were able to present showed that there was thrombotic microangiopathy and increased bleeding predisposition coexisting in patient with COVID-19. Another neuropsychiatric syndrome which is appearing in the literature is delirium, which actually was reported in previous coronaviruses, but it's difficult to untease what's unique to this virus and critical illness in general. But a nice observational study of hospitalized older adults and older adults in the community asked whether the presence of delirium was common in elderly cohorts with COVID-19. They found delirium to be far more common in frail older adults hospitalized with COVID-19 compared to non-frail adults of the same age. So this study really urges clinicians to suspect COVID-19 and was kind of uh, seminal in the fact that it changed opinion in that we should be assessing changes in mental status when assessing this population. Now, no one really wants to return to the catastrophic sort of spread and preventable hospitalizations amongst frail, vulnerable older adults. So if we're able to identify features like delirium, hopefully that will mitigate those in future. Now, the last study in my whistle-stop tour of some highlights in the literature is concerning the neuropsychiatric burden of patients who have been discharged after treatment for COVID-19. So this is a nice cross-sectional survey with well-validated psychiatric measures, which actually has shown that 12.4% of respondents had significant symptoms of PTSD around a month after discharge. Um, and there were also similar rates of anxiety and almost 20% of the cohort had symptoms of depression too. Interestingly, perceived discrimination was actually ranked as the most important predictor of these. So sorry, I'll take a breath and I'm apologizing for the, the rapid nature of the talk, but hopefully I've gone through it okay. Thank you all for listening. And um, to get any more detailed summaries, please do, please do visit the blog. And I've also put our contact details on here. If you'd like to get in touch or involved with any of the work that we're doing, we, we love new recruits. So um, that, that would be great. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Cameron. That was fantastic. A very good run through of some of the most interesting recent papers. Um, do That's the first time we've done that. So please, people, do let us know if you liked the literature update like that and if you'd like more of that. Um, meanwhile, let's move on now. Jerome Breen is uh, from King's in London. is going to present to us on RAMP, the Repeated Assessment of Mental and Neural Health uh, Study and also the Coping Study. So Jerome, over to you. So I should say that I'm a, I'm a psychiatric geneticist, I'm not a clinician, so I'm, I'm somewhat of an uh, interloper into this space, but um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, large-scale studies of surveillance really of mental and neurological symptoms in the community uh, during COVID-19. Um, so you all know this literature extremely well. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is having acute uh, neuropsychiatric and neurological effects we also know that COVID-19 infection may be causing some degree of brain injury, even in those people who aren't, aren't yeah, admitted to ICU, for example, or, or hospitalized. Um, we've been running a study called COPING and not another very similar study in, over social media called RAMP, where we've uh, attempted to uh, do a very detailed baseline assessment of people's psychiatric um, diagnoses and symptoms, uh, somewhat briefer assessment of their neurological signs and symptoms, and then added, and then various aspects of behavior uh, related to um, the pandemic and compliance with pandemic measures, as well as alcohol and drug use and so on. Um, RAMP is in, is in, is over social media during the pandemic. Coping is in a series of recontactable cohorts that we've already recruited and on, and on which we have pre-existing data, which will, will be, uh, which is very useful. It, the, at the base of these studies, we have a baseline survey, which takes 30 to 40 minutes if you're well, and it probably takes just over an hour if you have a, a psychiatric or a, you know, considerable physical health problem. Uh, we initially did a follow-up survey every two weeks uh, for 15 minutes, but we've changed that to every every month now. And we also carry out a brief survey after any major change in pandemic restrictions to look at impact. 
So um, our total sample size uh, for the analysis I'll present today um, in coping, it's um, 29,000 individuals um, in, our, in our baseline data set with 17,000 average NF follow-up. Uh, in RAMP, it's uh, nearly 9,000 people with average NF follow-up of uh, 4,800. Um, okay, I should say, explain then, the recontactable cohorts that are in coping roughly mean that about a half of the people in coping have a pre-existing psychiatric diagnosis. And we've, in the results that I present, we've checked out, checked out whether that makes a difference. Uh, and in broad scale terms, actually it doesn't. Um, but let me move on to some results. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the neurological side of things, but first of all, just the common mental health outcomes. We were very surprised actually overall in the data set that we didn't see strong evidence of an increase of anxiety, in anxiety and depression in this cohort. Especially, and that's because for most people, we actually had pre-existing estimates of their depression and anxiety levels. Um, but what that masked, actually, there was no average change, no overall change, really. But what that masked was that people aged 19 to 35, and particularly those uh, aged 19 to 25, had a large increase in their symptoms uh, of, of anxiety and depression. Um, so actually, although, although I'm mainly going to focus on COVID cases from here on in, uh, the impact of the pandemic on mental health seems to have been predominantly in young, younger people with actually older people doing better in terms of their mental health. So moving on to COVID, um, COVID cases within our data set. Um, we looked, we applied the uh, Zoe app definition. So um, from, this, from um, the MENA et al. 2020 paper. And these were the breakdown, this was the breakdown of COVID cases versus unaffected or unsymptomatic um, um, people within our data set. And as you can see, we had a reasonable number. If I look at that, if we look at that as an area plot, we can see that basically the highest rates um, of around seven to eight percent were seen between 19 and about 45. Um, we, uh, we applied the this, this algorithm, which is, I think, the, the algorithm that pe people do use almost everywhere now for prob probable COVID case. But we also added uh, a, a category when people had reported having a, pos a positive COVID case. So this number is slightly increased. Uh, one thing just to, I would note, key worker status. So that is, you know, someone works in a hospital or in a school was completely unpredictive of of COVID infection in our data, uh, which we were actually, you know, a little bit surprised by. Um, so we went first into kind of functional neurological disorders. We looked at chronic chronic fatigue. We assessed this using the Childer fatigue scale, which is these questions. Um, we asked people to consider the last month when they answered them. So it's basically around tiredness and strength and energy and concentration and memory. Um, so this is, a, this is a thresholded scale and allows us to categorize people into probable chronic fatigue and not. So in, a total, in our total sample, we had 775 COVID cases and 12,204 unaffected. Within them, the rate of probable, probable chronic, chronic fatigue in the COVID cases was 48.6% versus 28.1% in the non-COVID cases. Those numbers are slightly inflated because we had included people with lots of, lots of people with a previous mental health diagnosis, but they shift down a little bit if you exclude them, but basically they, the story is the same. And actually I, I'm gonna show you that now. So, so basically if we look at people with, without a pre-existing mental health diagnosis, the rates drop, but the odds ratio remains basically the same. So we've got an odds ratio of over two for chronic fatigue in COVID cases. And I should say that all of these are significant to like 10 to the minus P equals 10 to the minus six or so. Um, we also then looked at specific neurological symptoms. So we had the uh, 
uh, ALS functional rating scale and the Parkinson's non-motor scale. Um, we were you know, had a panel of neuro neurologists and neuropsychiatrists who advised us which questions to, to take from this. Um, we looked at limb weakness within the past month. And we found that people who had, co had COVID had 25% reported limb weakness versus 11% in non-COVID. The odds ratio for that was 2.84. Difficulty walking um, in the past month. The odds ratio for that was uh, was a, was striking in a four point zero four. Um, but I would just note that actually there were significant differences for basically all basically fatigue related items, including fine motor control, but also walking upstairs, etc. Et so that's, there seemed to be a general specific uh, picture, a general non-specific picture. One negative thing was um, we did ask um, a sleepiness scale on the advice of sleep experts. Uh, so this is the Epworth sleepiness scale. It, it asks essentially around uh, the questions around daytime sleepiness, but it does ask people to disregard times when they feel tired. Um, or fatigue, I guess. And actually, there was no difference between our COVID cases and our non-COVID cases in this particular metric. And I, I just wonder if that's perhaps down to the fact that basically we were, we were asking people about this at the height of lockdown, when, you know, I think one, one possible feature of lockdown is that for most people, they were getting reasonable amounts of sleep. Um, but the other question then is, how is your memory? So we asked a few questions about memory in a few different ways. And this is just a question from the Childhood Fatigue Scale. But uh, generally, we found that COVID cases were reporting a far higher rate of worse or much worse memory. Um, so the odds ratio for that was about 2.17. So overall, you know, this study is very interesting. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's got a large number of people in the community. It's got a, a significant number of COVID cases, but of course we don't know their severity. And one thing I would highlight, we used a probab probabilistic case definition and we relied on self-report of a positive, case, positive test. And that prob probably means our case definition has a high type one error rate. Also, is there, a large, sorry, there's too many huges in this sentence, I do apologize. Um, is there a contribution from the relatively huge social and economic uncertainty that that um, people are undergoing? And, you know, there are things in the data set that we also see that rates of domestic violence and alcohol use are yeah, seem to have really spiked since the since the start of the pandemic. And is that contributing to, for example, chronic fatigue uh, symptoms? Um, so basically, the fatigue and memory problems we're seeing could be indicative of functional neurological problems or deficits due to COVID-19, but they could also be due to other factors. And we know that COVID-19 affects the brain and body in diverse ways across diverse organs. So our next step then will be to confirm if these problems are mechanistically associated with the direct effects of COVID-19 infection. We're going to do this in something called the COVID CNS study, which is led by myself and Ben Michael in Liverpool. Um, this has just got funded. It's a 2.8 million pound study and is a collaboration across both neurology and psychiatry and basic neurosciences. And I'm not going to name all the acronyms here, but we, we basically are very happy with the collection of uh, people involved and the, the basic institution supporting this study. Uh, our basic research question is what are the clinical characteristics and mechanisms of acute COVID-19 neurological and neuropsychiatric complications? I'm not gonna talk you through all our aims, but it's quite biology, but also kind of social focus, has a social and medical record focus to try and understand the interplay of risk factors. Um, this just shows, shows our study design. Sorry, there seems to be a slight formatting error on my part here. 
Um, but essentially, we want to recruit 800 uh, cases with an acute neurological or neuropsychiatric complication in hospital, compare them to around 500 controls, some of whom were admitted to hospital for COVID, some of whom were admitted to hospital for non-COVID reasons. And then we'll compare them with data from uh, the coping study, which I've just presented to you. We're going to recruit them from all four UK nations, and we'll probably have upwards of, of 15 centers involved in the study. Um, our plan is to, is to uh, carry out a, a single in-person assessment, uh, um, you know, probably one to nine months post-discharge actually, at which we will assess psychiatric symptoms and history, do online cognitive tests, uh, as well as a, a neurological physical exam. Uh, we will carry out case note review, filling in electronic CRFs for neurological and other clinical information, and carry out neuroimaging in uh, about two thirds of participants um, for a variety of purposes. Everybody will have genetic data generated, and then we'll be uh, we will follow up people online and through their medical records uh, at least two times further within the study. I will finish here. Sorry, I, I rushed through that to try and try and give you a flavor of what we're doing. Obviously, it's a complex study. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jerome. Thank you very much. That was really excellent run through. Um, so people can please post their questions on the chat function. And also, uh, Cecile, if you want to turn your uh, camera on and your microphone on again so that uh, you can join in some of the discussion. Um, let's see, we've got a question from Anna Sanford James. Uh, in relation to your talk, Jerome, were there or are there any measures of cognitive functioning taken? Uh, I think yeah, that, might have, that might have been. Bef yeah. So yes, I mean, basically, in co in coping and rapid, yeah, no, we didn't. Yeah, we only have a sort of implicit um, kind of cognitive function where we ask people how their memory is, how the concentration is, etc. We do actually have, though, like the timings of how long it took them to complete certain questionnaires. So we could infer some things from that if we wanted to. But however, in this COVID CNS study, we are actually doing a formal set of cognitive tests, and that should allow us uh, to assess actual, you know, functional domains impacted, cognitive domains impacted, and we're, 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 we will assess kind of pre-morbid levels of functioning in a subset of people as well. Great, thank you. Um, I want to know, says uh, MD Armand Ghazi, about PTSD in brief. Um, yeah, so PTSD, um, if I could tell you, if I can answer that question next week, it would be great because we haven't, I mean, we were analyzing that data like late last night and this morning. So we, PTSD is next up. Um, I, do, I do expect, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, there will be, a, I, I would lay a lot of money that there's gonna be a, quite a good signal on PTSD. Yeah. Um, I mean, that raises a question that I think is relevant for, for both you and Cecile, and, you know, because that's about how much of what we're seeing is just a consequence of, in your case, Jerome, the fact that people are going through something traumatic or for Cecile, the fact that people are on intensive care. Um, we know that people get complications just from those episodes and then how much is specific to COVID-19 in particular. Maybe Jerome, if you want to answer that first and then Cecile. Yeah, well, I mean, that is, that is really the key question. I mean, it's part of, part of the reason that we named the study coping, you know, um, essentially we can see a strong signal in younger people that they are not coping as well with, with the general, general pandemic. And it's obvious that basically co personal coping mechanisms and social support will explain some of, especially the mental health side of things. However, uh, you know, I'm a psychiatric geneticist. There's all, there are considerable biological bases, bases to a lot of these things. And really what we need to do is understand the interplay of those two things and quantitate both sides of that. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Sophia? It's a sem very similar question come from Segun Emmanuel Ibotoye. Uh, how are you able to, sorry, that's the actually wrong name, but the right question. How can we uh, prove the causal relation between COVID and neurological manifestations? That's come from Fouad Abdallah. Um, 
Yeah, that, that's a that's a very good question. That's a, a question we often ask uh, ourselves when we see the patient. So, uh, I think that there are obviously some complications uh, which are not COVID nineteen related that we could uh, encounter in uh, other infections uh, if patients had been severely uh, ill with uh, ICU long ICU stays, etc. Um, so, what is uh, specific to COVID nineteen? Um, and what is uh, evidence for a causal relationship? Uh, I think that th there are here, uh, two questions, maybe the question of uh, immune-mediated uh, complications, uh, which can be seen as indirect um, complications of COVID-19, but which can be quite specific because I think that we all agree with uh, all the patients we have seen that there are some particular patients uh, and it has been well showed by, by our EEG team with uh, these patients with movement disorders and periodic discharges, and uh, they did not have any evidence for other cause of encephalopathy. So there was this very particular syndrome, but which we do not think um, we do not think it is caused directly by uh, viral neuroinvasion, which is uh, then another uh, uh, another uh, another category, but. Uh, I, I think that today, uh, as far as I know from the literature, the, the evidence uh, from neuroinvasiveness uh, by SARS-CoV-2 uh, is quite scarce. Uh, we have uh, neuropathological data, uh, recent um, study published in the Lancet Neurology by the German team who found uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the brain, but uh, without evidence for very uh, specific uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, caused uh, lesions. Uh, so to, to, to make it short, I think that really um, today uh, and in our experience uh, in our center, uh, we, we didn't see patients uh, with clear uh, evidence from neuroinvasiveness. None of the patients has, has SARS-CoV-2 in the CSF, for example, which is a strong clue for that. Uh, we have seen patients with, with uh, um, clinical pictures of encephalopathy with presumed immune mechanism, which were responsive to immunotherapy uh, and which were different uh, from uh, patients with uh, critical illness and ICU related encephalopathy. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a few questions actually. So if we, if we can keep the answer short, we'll, we'll get through more of them and that will keep everybody happy. But one I want to ask you both again, actually, is this term delirium. So it, it was interesting, Cecile, you talked about encephalopathy. Uh, you didn't use the word delirium once. I was looking very carefully. Um, we had a paper on delirium mentioned by Cameron. Uh, in, you know, the, uh, I think neurologists use the term uh, encephalopathy. The psychiatrists, psychologists, geriatricians use the term delirium. Uh, does it matter which term we use, uh, you know, should we be talking, should we be going down into a bit more detail to distinguish different types of encephalopathy? Maybe Jerome, I'll, I'll start with you because you've seen some of the uh, literature on this following our uh, series in, of our 153 patients in Lancet Psychiatry. Uh, you know, there was some um, feedback from people who said we should really be using uh, the term delirium to describe some of our patients. Yeah, so I mean, I think that um... Yeah, I, I mean, I think it depends on who sees patients and what severity they are. I mean, this is just my impression. I'm a non-clinician, right? But, uh, but I, I, know, I, I can very clearly know that psychologists see different sets of patients to psychiatrists to neurologists. And, you know, it, it, when a psychologist uses the term delirium, they're probably not seeing the same severity of patient as, as a neurologist or, or, a, or a psychiatrist would be. And, you know, psychiatrists may not be seeing as severe a patient as a neurologist is. Yeah. So, and, and I think therein lies some of the confusion in the literature. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, just, that's me as a non-clinician trying to observe across. You're an impartial, impartial observer. Cecile, do your geriatric and ITU colleagues uh, um, get cross with you for not distinguishing delirium from other forms of encephalopathy? Yeah. We use the term encephalopathy because yeah, I think it is a very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, term. Uh, it's true that uh, geriatry and ICU uh, colleagues often use the term del delirium. Uh, and for me, it refers to 
this kind of agitated uh, uh, awakening uh, after sedation withdrawal. Uh, so we, we prefer to use the term encephalopathy to be very um, inclusive uh, yeah. for all uh, yeah. and dysfunctions. Uh, because uh, some uh, patients with delirium uh, were responsive to immunotherapy, for example, even if they had a classical delirium uh, mm. uh, pic pictures. So I think that to the term and what you put, uh, which patient you put under uh, every uh, umbrella term is not uh, relevant uh, for mm. clinical practice. Kate, uh, Kate McBurton has, has made that same point actually. Um, uh, the neuropsychiatric definition of delirium requires a, a, a turnness, cognitive disorientation state by definition, whereas encephalopathy is more generic. I, th I think encephalopathy is a broader umbrella term, isn't it? Mm. Um, let's see what we have here now. Uh, we've covered some of these. Yeah, there's a question about uh, the, actually it's from the same Kate. Uh, are there any early indicators of seizure history and or acute EEG findings that might indicate potential predisposing factors for COVID, for neuro-COVID? Um, interestingly, all, all patients who presented with uh, seizures, uh, none of them had history of, uh, of seizures. Uh, we had, uh, I think, four patients uh, with um, uh, EEG findings of um, acute ep epileptiform activity, but all patients with uh, epilepsy uh, uh, did not have uh, previously uh, seizures. I think that one of them had glioblastoma. It was uh, you know, like an exception, but uh, all of them had no, uh, no history of seizures. Yeah. All right, well, we, we better stop there. We, uh, we're told to stop five minutes before the hour so that people can have a stretch or run around so that Jerome can do a few more of his weights, which are just uh, behind him uh, before the next um, uh, Zoom meeting that we all have. But Cecile uh, and Jerome, and indeed Cameron, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the three of you for, for participating in this webinar. There's Cameron. Um, it seems like people did like the five minute interlude with a, a brief update on the publications. So I'm sure we'll do that again. I'd also like to thank the Global Health Network team for supporting this uh, webinar. So uh, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, then uh, do please uh, look out for the next webinar and also let your friends know about these so that they can join us. But for now, um, thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye now.